Self-supervised learning is currently one of the most interesting ideas in deep learning and artificial intelligence. The idea behind self-supervised learning is to take unlabeled data and artificially construct a task, such as rotating it and predicting the rotation angle, to learn representations for images. And this is obviously really interesting because unlabeled data is much easier to get than labeled data. For example, you can go to YouTube and just extract frames from videos and construct these massive data sets. But a massive problem with current self-supervised learning algorithms is that they don't use the same features for something like rotation prediction as ImageNet classification. And this is because they can exploit low-level or high-frequency details in the images, like imaging artifacts, that give clues about the self-supervised learning task. Automatic shortcut removal uses an adversarially trained image-to-image -image translation UNet to pre-process images such that the resulting image makes the self-supervised learning task more difficult resulting in more semantic downstream representations for transfer to other computer vision tasks. The authors show big improvements for ImageNet and Places 205 classification by adding the lens filter to self-supervised representation learning. The authors also provide insights into visualizing how the lens modifies images and how these modifications give hints about how to stack multiple self-supervised learning tasks for multitask learning. This video will explain the details behind automatic shortcut removal for self-supervised learning. This video will explain the automatic shortcut removal technique from researchers at Google Brain, illustrated as an adversarial lens for input images in order to make sure that neural network solving self-supervised learning tasks like rotation prediction are learning semantic features that are actually useful for applications like ImageNet classification. Self-supervised learning algorithms are enormously powerful for these data-hungry deep learning systems. The idea behind self-supervised learning is to construct these pre-text tasks which is how you take unlabeled data and then modify it in some way with some kind of label such that you have a supervised learning task to train the model on this unlabeled data. So this is most straightforward in natural language processing where you have these massive uh, text data that you're able to get from the internet like the uh, colossal, clean, crawled, corpus, something like that or like the Wikipedia where you just grab all the Wikipedia data and all these massive amounts of text data and what they do in order to learn representations from this unlabeled text data is they do this language modeling objective which is a self-supervised learning task where the pretext task is to predict the next token and then iteratively keep doing that in an autoregressive way until you learn a useful representation of language. BERT also does this in a different way where you mask out intermediate tokens in the sequence and this is how they define the self-supervised learning task. In computer vision, self-supervised learning is used in a ton of different ways. Some of the most common are rotation prediction, where you take an original image and then you rotate it and you predict the rotation angle. So here, 90 degrees, 180 degrees, and then 270 degrees. The exemplar task, where you form artificial classes with the data augmentation, relative patch location, a jigsaw. And we've also seen a lot of advancements lately in contrastive self-supervised learning, where the objective, the pretext task, is to have similar scores for positive pairs and dissimilar scores for negative pairs. The problem with some of these self-supervised learning tasks, especially in vision, is that if, instead of learning that uh, this is like the bird's head and to look at how the bird's head is turned in order to predict the rotation angle, rather what will happen in these self-supervised learning tasks is that the vision models will learn to exploit low-level features like these uh, chromatic aberrations or miscellaneous nuances in the image that allow it to solve the rotation task without actually forming a useful representation to transfer to something like ImageNet classification. This diagram shows the framework of the lens algorithm for automatic shortcut removal for self-supervised learning. The framework here is using adversarial training. Adversarial training, like generative adversarial networks, describes this paradigm in which you have two neural networks that are competing against each other to optimize each other. So in this way, the lens network takes the input image and tries to produce a corrupted image such that the rotation prediction network fails on the task. And the advantage of doing this is that the, uh, well, as the lens is uh, corrupting these images, the feature extractor no longer can rely on these low-level features in order to uh, predict if the, how much the image has been rotated, rather needs to learn more semantic features that are useful for downstream transfer. The authors describe two different paradigms used to send a supervised signal back to the lens network to modify how it's changing these images for input into the self-supervised learning task network. So the first is full adversarial training. Full adversarial training, described as having the adversarial uh, network's loss function, basically just be the inverse of the success of the self-supervised learning task. So if the self-supervised learning task has a high loss, then the adversary will have a low loss, and inversely. Least likely describes where the lens is trying to bias the predicted class probabilities towards the least likely class. So in the rotation prediction example, let's say we have uh, the potential outputs are 0 degrees, 90 degrees, 180 degrees, and 270 degrees. In this case, the adversary or the lens uh, output is going to be trying to put the image into the least likely class. 
based on the original prediction. So we'll be trying to say take a zero degree bird and put it into the 270 degree uh, prediction with some kind of modification to the original image. But then in order to make sure that uh, these modifications to the image aren't too ridiculous because if this is the objective, say uh, the full adversarial training is just the inverse of the success on the self-supervised learning task, the uh, input could just map, black it out the image so that you know it's impossible to predict the rotation angle. So the idea here is that you also have this L2 reconstruction loss. Similar to papers like uh, SimGAN and pix to pix SimGAN does this thing where it takes uh, uh, eye images that come out of a graphics engine and it tries to make it more realistic. But the idea again is to make sure that these uh, modifications from the image to image translation network don't change the image too dramatically with the adversarial loss in order to make it so the image still kind of represents the original input. So you weight these two losses, the adversarial loss with the reconstruction loss weighted by this parameter lambda. The adversarial lens network used for automatic shortcut removal uses a UNet style architecture for image to image translation. Image to image translation describes this task of taking in an input image and then producing another image. The idea behind the UNet and why it's interesting for this application is that it has these identity skip connections, like in the residual neural network, otherwise known as the ResNet, that propagate information ahead from early layers into layer, later layers. And the reason this is interesting is it makes the identity connection much, the identity mapping much easier to learn because this uh, lens network has to satisfy not only the adversarial loss with respect to how well it's corrupted the image and made the self-supervised learning task harder, but it also has a reconstruction loss, which penalizes it for making too dramatic of a difference to the original image. So these skip connections make it much easier to propagate information ahead to avoid changing the image too much while also adding these semantically uh, useful features in these kind of layers for the sake of the adversarial loss. The authors originally test the concept of automatic shortcut removal by artificially adding these synthetic shortcuts like the arrow shortcut and these dog and plane and uh, bird images as well as the chromatic aberrations. So you can see the difference from the uh, lens output. So the lens takes this in as input and then it produces this image and then you can subtract the difference between the two images in order to get this visualization of what the lens network has done to modify the original network. And you can also see the difference between uh, when they add these uh, synthetic shortcuts or these extra modifications to the image that make the uh, self-supervised learning task easier, you see the difference in the performance with the downstream representations. So the baseline when you just do uh, take these inputs and train the self-supervised learning network, you get about 18% and 19% accuracy when you're then using it for CIFAR 10 classification compared to 76.8 uh, and 73.5 that almost recover the uh, complete clean data using the uh, labels with the self-supervised learning task. So it's already a great proof of concept showing how uh, applying this lens filter can dramatically improve the representations learned on the self-supervised learning task. The authors further test this in the more real setting on the ImageNet and Places 205 datasets. So you can see the improvements made by using the lens filter with respect to the original images on the rotation, exemplar, relative patch location, and jigsaw tasks on the ImageNet and Places 205 dataset. In both cases, what you're doing is you're doing the self-supervised learning task with either the original images or the images after they've been modified by the lens network, or the uh, fast gradient sign method, which is another adversarial uh, modification used as a baseline to kind of illustrate the uh, gain of lens compared to other techniques for doing adversarial perturbations to the images. You see a gain in every case of using this kind of a filter onto the image. One of the interesting characteristics of this lens pre-processing or this automatic shortcut removal is that you can visualize what it's done to the original image, and hopefully that'll help you get more of a sense of your data set or your pretext task and how you might, uh, what kind of features are being exploited to make the task easier without the lens network. So in this case, you see the difference between uh, varying that lambda parameter. So what the lens network has is the adversarial loss with respect to how well it's changing the image to make the self-supervised learning task harder, but it also has this reconstruction loss, which basically is a loss based on how different the original image is to the image that comes out of the network. So you see the differences between how it modifies the images with respect to changing the strength of the reconstruction loss also showing, you see this image on the uh, far right with the very small reconstruction loss where it's really dramatically changed the image, so, sort of showing the importance of having this kind of reconstruction loss in these image-to-image -image translation networks used for data augmentation. The authors further provide visualizations of how the lens changes the images across the different pretext tasks from rotation, exemplar, relative patch location, and jigsaw. And they find that the features removed by the lens are the most semantically meaningful for the rotation task potentially explaining why this representation outperforms the other tasks. And they describe this by the features removed by the lens of the most semantically meaningful by looking at the density over this kind of a difference. And you see that it subtracts things like the, uh, in the rotation task, 
He subtracts things like the uh, lion's head compared to these kind of uh, like random features that are used in the exemplar output from the lens. And they explain this as a visualization to help get a better sense of these different pretext tasks. Another interesting detail they report from their experiments is the correlation of the per image reconstruction losses between the different pretext tasks. In this case, you see that there's high correlation between the relative patch location and then the uh, jigsaw task. And then you see that there's low correlation between the exemplar and rotation, showing that this kind of a visualization matrix might show how you could combine these pretext tasks for multitask self-supervised learning. So this paper, Multitask Self-Supervised Learning, finds gains achieved by combining the pre-training tasks. So in this case, you have rotation prediction, uh, colorization, exemplar, and MS, which is uh, motion segmentation. So you see the difference between just doing rotation prediction and then doing all four of these tasks in the network. So this kind of visualization with the lens output, the lens output can help you get a better sense of which tasks you might combine in the multitask self-supervised learning, and it might be the best way of learning these representations by having them perform many of these different uh, pretext tasks that you can do on unlabeled data sets, totally free, just applying this uh, transformation and artificial label to get representations out of unlabeled data. In the paper, the authors also explore using the YouTube 8 million data set to have this unlabeled data set for doing self-supervised learning on. And this is really interesting, this YouTube 8 million frames data set, particularly uh, YouTube as a data source, because you get these uh, videos on YouTube is some ridiculous amount of hours of YouTube videos that are uploaded every day. And if you think about how much uh, image data you can extract from these videos, you usually have about 30 frames per second. So for every second of video, there's 30 images for that video. So you imagine how much data could potentially come out of YouTube. And to help motivate this idea of why self-supervised learning is so interesting, with ImageNet, you have about 1.4 million labeled images. And that's obviously a ridiculously uh, you know, manual labor kind of effort in order to construct something like ImageNet, Whereas with YouTube, you could just uh, get this data and just extract like billions or trillions of images and then learn useful representations for downstream tasks. So in this case, they're experimenting with the YouTube 8 million frames data set. They use 1 million of these frames. So even in this experiment, they're still not at the real scale of what YouTube could really produce with unlabeled data. Rather, they're just using 1 million, which is actually even less than ImageNet. But in this case, they're looking at the nuances of the YouTube data and how this might be problematic with the unlabeled data set for self-supervised learning. So for example, these YouTube uh, frames, they have logos of TV stations, a lot more text from credits. There's a lot more text in the data of the YouTube frames than say ImageNet. And text is, a, if you rotate it or things like that, it is just a dead giveaway for these uh, self-supervised learning pre-text pre -text tasks. So you see the uh, difference between the YouTube 1 million and ImageNet for the sake of ImageNet evaluation, which is kind of unfair because it's the same data set and then the gap closing with the places 205. But in both cases, you see the difference between the baseline and then using this lens filter, a big gain by using this lens filter, particularly in this case on the ImageNet with the YouTube 1 million data set. The authors compare the modifications that Lens makes to the ImageNet data points compared to the YouTube 8 million frames and show how this might help to identify data set bias. So in the ImageNet trained uh, lens output, you see them erasing things like the uh, dog facial features compared to what the YouTube uh, lens outputs helps them get more insight into what kind of data is in ImageNet compared to what kind of data is in YouTube. And having this kind of visualization is really important for getting a better understanding of these massive data sets. It's also interesting to see that the YouTube 1 million data set is more sensitive to the text shortcut, naturally because there's probably more text in these YouTube frames compared to ImageNet uh, images. Another interesting technique that came out recently is adversarial propagation, where you add the adversarial examples to the data set in order to improve the supervised learning performance. And one interesting uh, characteristic of the adprop algorithm compared to this automatic shortcut removal that might be interesting to see them combined is that the adprop has this uh, separate auxiliary batch normalization to process the uh, mean variance statistics for the adversarial images compared to the clean images. So it might be interesting to see that kind of uh, thing in integrated into the lens thing with the way that it uh, handles this distribution shift because the lens output is gonna have a distribution shift from the original images. So what they do now is they're just concatenating the features from the raw and lens process. It seems like they're just maybe concatenating them along the feature dimension rather than having maybe like an internal structure like the adprop algorithm and the auxiliary batch normalization that handles this distribution shift between the lens output and the original clean images. Another reason why this lens automatic shortcut removal technique is so interesting is because it can easily be stacked on top of these other self-supervised learning algorithms like the recent SimCLR contrast of self-supervised learning algorithm. You could imagine taking these uh, XI prime and XJ prime and passing them both through lens as well and then having them go into this feature extractor F and just fitting this into this pipeline as well. So it's definitely interesting to think about how you could integrate this kind of uh, like adversarial modification network into any of these kinds of tasks, even supervised learning, 
as we've done with the ad prop algorithm, but there are all sorts of ways that you can stack this kind of adversarial image to image translation for the sake of data augmentation on miscellaneous tasks. Thanks for watching this explanation of the lens automatic shortcut removal technique, a really interesting strategy of using an image to image translation to pre-process images to make self-supervised learning tasks more difficult. By making the self-supervised learning tasks like rotation prediction or colorization more difficult, the network has to learn a more semantic representation useful for downstream task transfer. And this is really interesting because we can get these massive unlabeled data sets that can learn better representations to solve these computer vision problems. Thanks for watching and please subscribe to Henry AI Labs for more deep learning and AI videos.